You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here talking with Dylan Gowan, a well-known drummer from the GTA. He's played with acts such as Vesperia, Birds of Bellwoods, and of course, his own project, Iomare. He's also known for his appearances on Banger TV. Dylan, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Really happy to be here. So I think the first question I have for you is going to be pretty obvious. When are we going to hear the Alaska Highway album? (laughs) <laughs> wow man you really did your homework uh the Alaska highway record i think is on uh indefinite hiatus i think uh uh that that project was kind of like uh it was a joke it was a joke band that was started with uh myself and a couple of the members of birds of bellwoods and uh bronze medalist uh olympian uh jeremy abbott uh very very talented uh figure skater we all uh we all just kind of formed this this fake uh band and on uh halloween we kind of made one really joke single uh because we had the day off and we just uh we just had a blast making it it was just kind of an inside joke that we had throughout that whole entire tour you know it's you know it's really funny before the um the before our show with um before that show with uh, birds of bellwoods that song would be like our intro track before going going onto the ice and playing uh, playing our set, which which we, we were we were like cracking up every single time because we would hear like uh, the stage manager just going like, okay, you got um, five minutes before you go on stage, and we're just cracking up, laughing the whole entire time. So uh, lots of lots of fun moments on that tour, that's for sure. I like to uh, always back up with people and just kind of, I imagine everyone is superheroes, so I need to know your superhero origin story. So if you'd like to take <laughs> me back, I, I need to know, who is the young Dylan Gowan? What's going through his mind? What's influencing him? And how does he discover his passion for music? Well, I mean, it kind of started pretty early on. Uh, my whole entire family, they're all they are all musicians. Like, everybody plays uh, an instrument like my, my dad uh, plays piano my my uncles they play guitar and, and bass my cousin plays um, it, it's pretty much like music was such a prominent thing growing up that it was only kind of a natural uh, thing that I would kind of gravitate towards uh, very early on and uh, I just I wanted to pick an instrument that no one no one else um, was uh was well had any experience in so i decided to to pick up the drums and uh and i just absolutely loved it and it, when i realized that uh i wasn't going to make the nhl anytime soon i decided to take it a lot more seriously and uh and yeah i've just i've just had uh just an absolute uh blast just uh just being a working musician in uh in toronto and and yeah no it's been it's been a really wild ride so far what were some of your earlier influences, like bands that you loved from an early age? Oh, that that's it, it ranges from all over the place. It goes from like progressive rock and to some of like the early kind of, you know, warp tour bands or uh, like kind of the, the punkish scene. And then eventually, um, you know, and some pop here every now and again. And so it was kind of a, a mixed bag of a lot of different uh, styles. And then eventually when I was, um, I think I was about, I want to say 12 or 13 that I really started getting into metal. And that was because I was staying up every weekend up until like two o'clock in the morning when you had uh, much loud and they would play all of these like big metal bands. So that you'd hear like Slipknot and System of a Down, Deftones, you would hear like those kinds of, uh, those kinds of bands playing. And then every now and again, they would play an extreme band. So sometimes you would have like, like uh, like Opeth play, or you would have uh, Catatonia every now and again. Like that was kind of like a really rarity thing. And eventually, I kind of went into the progressive metal uh, sphere because what was so intriguing about that genre was that the rules are there are none, pretty much. It's like you yeah. can do everything and anything, and it's encouraged to be more uh, experimental with your songwriting. And that's what was so intriguing about it is that since I love all styles of music. Uh, and the fan base of progressive metal share that same kind of um, that uh, openness when it comes to uh, different genres. It just made sense to kind of go into that that direction. How it just 
seeing how so many bands sound so different from each other and they're able to kind of do their own spin on genres that they like. And yeah, I, I just think over time, just seeing more and more bands get more experimental and starting to kind of uh, craft their own sound. I think it's, uh, I think it's just a genre that is just continuously evolving uh, and just newer bands are coming up with some great stuff like 12 foot ninja has some really really intriguing stuff incorporating a lot of reggae and latin influences um i would say even uh groups like dune that, that i just reviewed uh about a couple of weeks ago kind of having the sludge metal thing mixed with with doom but also like moments of alternative rock and um yeah it, i just think it's just a I think it's just more of the it's just more of a fun genre to to really kind of dive in and like I could talk for days about it. <laughs> it it must have been like an aha moment when you discovered Prague. It was like this is this is my world. This is where I belong kind of a thing. And in 2017, I think back when you made your first appearance on Banger TV, it was on a Locked Horns episode and you were called in for progressive metal. And since then, you've kind of become the go-to guy for progressive metal at Banger TV. Do you do you enjoy ha having that position? <laughs> oh, I love it. And it, it's funny how the Banger TV kind of came about because that was through um, a friend's recommendation. Uh, my friend uh, Lindsay Schoolcraft, uh, she she recommended me to be on the on the Prague uh, uh, episode. And I remember just being incredibly nervous going uh, going on set and just kind of talking about uh you know my favorite genre so i was like i was so excited that i had all of these things that i wanted to say but it just completely left my mind the moment i went on uh, <laughs> uh the moment uh the camera started rolling and and then it's just kind of been a gradual uh, sorry a gradual uh thing just to kind of get more and more comfortable being uh being on on set and it was just something I was just really, I just really enjoyed. And, and then, uh, when it came time to, uh, sorry, kind of diverging a little bit of this, of, of the story a bit. Um, so I went to Ryerson for radio and television, uh, specifically for sports, for sport media, basically. Um, but while the other guys at, in, in my grade were going to like TSN and Sportsnet, or anything like that. I wanted to go into music and my professor was like screaming at me, like you're in the wrong program. You're going into music instead of sports. And I'm just like, well, I want to see if I can go into this, this direction. And so I asked um, Lisa if uh, Banger had a, an internship program and they said they don't, but they're willing to give me a shot. So, uh, so that's how I ended up being uh, Banger's first intern. And, and then basically they just started, um, you know, kind of show me how the things go behind the scenes. And then eventually they said, uh, well, the new Obscure record is coming out. You really like that band. And why don't you just, uh, why don't you just go and review it and we'll see what happens. So it was kind of like a bit of a tryout in a way. And now it's been about three years since, since, uh, since the start of that. And then I've loved every, every single moment of it. It, it must have been really quite the moment. Like, I mean, meeting Sam Dunn for the first time must have been quite, knowing from his, you know, making uh, metal, a headbanger's journey and global metal and all those documentaries, knowing that he's met like Bruce Dickinson and Lemmy and all these different people. And then just to have him come up to you and just be such a humble person, it must have been pretty mind blowing. Oh, that guy, that guy is so awesome to work with. He's such a, such a humble person and just, he's just a great, do to be to be around and and he deserves all the success and more because uh i mean the guy just works ridiculously hard at everything that he does and it's kind of uh like it's funny i've only met sam you know a handful of times despite me being uh being at banger films because the guy's just always working on the next project and it's always such a secret uh in between like um you know, the, the documentaries and the movies and all that stuff like that. So it's kind of like the moment one thing is done, he moves on immediately to the next thing. And he's, and he's just really uh, enthralled with the new, uh, with the new project that he's, uh, he's working on. And 
Banger TV is quite the project that he's made. I mean, he's made a really good team with you and Lisa and Daniel Decay and uh, Blaine. Like, all you guys are doing a really great job of it. But we got to move on more into your music. So you you went on tour at the age of, like, 17 or something like that, right? Like, you right. being a drummer, you, you, was everybody coming to you? Because like, everybody needs a drummer, you know what I mean? Nobody needs a guitarist, but everybody needs a drummer. So you must have been... A pretty busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just, it was just basically just trying to find uh, find bands to uh, to join, and that was it. Was such a weird thing from the start because I wouldn't be, I would only be allowed into 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 bars to just play the set, and then I would have to leave immediately after. So it was kind of a, <laughs> so it was kind of like one of those things where uh, you had to learn really quick how to set up, tear down your tear down your stuff, and then. And then leave. <laughs> but it was, uh, but yeah, it was at first really intimidating because you're kind of being thrown into this world that you're not too familiar with. And you just don't know how to basically, uh, you know, deal with a lot of the kind of uh, things that happen on the, on the road, but then you slowly kind of develop a routine over time. And now, and now to the point where you're not nervous anymore going out on tour, you're, you're excited, you're anxious to kind of, go out and play in front of people and uh yeah <laughs> and beginning iomer this is basically your brainchild am i saying that right That's iomer right. yeah, yep, yeah? You're all right. right yeah so uh i mean for, maybe we should start with the name how did you come up with that name <laughs> well i mean my background is irish and scottish and i thought um kind of giving it more of like an ancient kind of uh gaelic name uh, which is, it's essentially kind of a, it's a dead language, like Scottish and Irish Gaelic are, they, they're, they're similar, but they're different at the same time. So they use like similar uh, uh, words, but they, but they mean totally different things. And I thought kind of giving it more, because uh, since the project is primarily folk metal, I wanted to kind of uh, take a name from, from a, a language that's not really spoken anymore. And so when I found out that Iomer uh, means bear in in Scottish Gaelic. I thought that that was kind of a cool sounding name for the for the project, and that's the reason why I picked it. Okay, and this is helping me to understand now the cover art. Why you chose the cover art? Is that is that a polar bear? That's right. I thought it was a really interesting choice of the style of artwork. It's like what what is this? Is there a name for the style? Well, I mean the the artist was um who who made the the cover is a uh, is a Ukrainian Canadian artist uh Marie Cher and she's just absolutely just a fantastic um uh artist and she's worked with the many bands in Toronto and the idea the, the kind of concept behind it was that uh you know since Islemare means bear we really wanted to have the a polar bear on the cover um because a lot of the the songs on the record kind of are you know, some are depressing, some are, are lighthearted. So you have uh, the the visual of it being kind of this uh, dystopian frozen landscape uh, was kind of an intriguing uh, visual for the record. And the kind of the towers in the in the uh, in the cover kind of represent some uh, like this really prosperous thing, and then all of a sudden it it's fallen and it's collapsed and. And the polar bear is kind of observing uh, the whole kind of uh, the structure of, uh, structures of once of of this kind of uh, city, right? So I thought just having that frozen landscape and of snow, because um, you know, <laughs> being in uh, living in a tundra is, uh, is something you're familiar with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so kind of adding this the snow. Uh, uh, in in it and uh and just having it be nighttime because i thought uh it'd be kind of cool to have to have you know something that's really uh chilling to to be you know during uh during the nighttime i thought it was kind of a cool idea <laughs> but uh yeah it was that's kind of how the the artwork kind of came about was just the trading of different ideas between uh myself and marie and uh, the end result of it was just, uh, it blew my mind. And, uh, you know, it's, I just, it's funny. I just ran out of the polar bear shirts, uh, three <laughs> weeks ago. I finally got rid of the, the last, <laughs> the last batch, but we still, but we still have the lion ones still left, left there. We, I think we have like three XL and like one small still left, 
but the um yeah the other the lion one is kind of cool it was like it's kind of like a social commentary i guess on my views of of hunting like i think like i'm not opposed to people hunting i just think that it'd be you'd be a lot more badass if you didn't have a gun to go and hunt a lion i think if you did it with your bare hands i think you would um I think it would be better. <laughs> so I get where you're coming from with that. I get, especially with like, uh, there's kind of like two different types of trophy hunting, right? Like they, there's the, the it's, Harambe it's, kind of trophy hunting. And then there's like legit ethical hunting. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I should, I, sorry. I should clarify. Uh, like my views on trophy hunting is different from somebody who lives in a really isolated area that there's, that's their only way that they can get food. Sorry. I should totally clarify that. Like I'm yeah a, yeah no like, I think I think what you're talking about two different types of trophy hunting. There's the type of trophy hunting where it's like a rich billionaire going out to the safari to shoot a rhino that's endangered, exactly. versus trophy hunting, which is sustainable, ethical, and within an actual legal system. <laughs> yeah, like normally I'm not a very political person, right? I I you know I I treat everybody um, you know with with respect uh, as you know. Uh, the only thing that I that I just that I oppose of strongly politically is just the practice of of trophy hunting. I think that they're like I'm not against people eating meat. I'm not against people hunting for for food because the end result of it is is a lot more. Um, I think it's a lot more ethical if that's the the right the right word of it. I guess, but uh, yeah. But if you're going out of your way to kind of hunt an endangered animal that's just for the sake of mounting it on your wall i think that's such a bullshit thing uh to to do yeah it's we need a a new name for it because it's it's like there's two different types of trophy hunting that's that's one type and then there's the other types so we need another name for what you're talking about we should just call it uh rich people massacring animals for their self-righteous entertainment that's that's the one <laughs> <laughs> And with this album, the the debut album with Iomer, it, is that a concept album? Because I'm looking through the lyrics and some parts I can kind of piece together and I'm like, mm, I don't know if this is a concept. Was it ever meant to be at some point? Uh, it was never meant to be a concept record. It was more It was more just like different parts of my life that I wanted to get off my chest. And there was a lot uh. of different things that were... That were um, that I just wanted to kind of have a healthy outlet to kind of express. And, and sometimes with, with the songs, it's like, when you listen back on, on the first record, there's always going to be um, a lot of criticism on, on your end because, because it's just like, Oh, why did I write it like this? Why did I write the lyrics like this? Why did I, um, you know, why did I change this part or something like that? So when I listen to the first record, I kind of look at it more of a critical through a critical lens rather than just kind of enjoy the experience of the record. And that's something I just kind of have to learn over time is to not try and be overly critical, just be kind of like, right, this was how I was um, during that time. And now I feels like, like the songwriting now is a bit uh, is as improved for the second record. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, learning how to, how do we just enjoy a record rather than just be overly critical of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it must be a part of the evolution of the project going from really just being your brainchild where you really had control over every little thing. And then to now having new players come in and giving them space to create their own ideas as well. Yeah, no. And plus, sorry, my dog is barking up a storm in the background. <laughs> um, yeah, no, he's, um, no, what I loved about it is just that how everybody brought something new to the table, and what was really what was really interesting is like having uh, all these musicians that I've always wanted to work with kind of take the idea of the band and kind of do their own um, spin on it was really was really interesting, and and just having having Sam and Nathan and Tyler and just everybody who was just on board for the project, it just made the whole uh thing just way better like i only just gave them just the kind of the blueprints of how i want everything to go and here's the songs but they took the songs from uh from like what uh, like good to great <laughs> <laughs> you know and so, and so where are we now with the the second iomera album have we started tracking anything yet 
oh, it's done. It's fully done. It's just, it's, it's finally getting mastered at the moment. Uh, might not be, it might not be out uh, until uh, next year, or it could be out in the fall. It really kind of depends on how everybody's schedules, uh, schedules are. And it's a bit of a departure from the last one. There's a lot more folkier elements to it than, than the first one. Uh, there's a lot more symphonic elements to it. Um, it's the way that I've described, uh, the way that I've kind of described it is like, if you take Steely Dan, Elvati, Corpiclani, and, and, uh, Peter Frampton, and you throw them together into an orchestra, that's what the second Islemay record sounds like. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> begin to imagine. <laughs> Cause there's, that's awesome. There's moments where, because uh, I was just really influenced by like all of those things uh, during the writing process of that record, so I thought, oh, why don't I just throw everything in the kitchen sink at it and just see and just see what happens? And we we have a couple of new members in the group uh, now with um, with Mike and Alex, and and they're just two just killer guitar players, and uh, and yeah, it, it was just really cool to kind of have them on board for the for the record, and they brought their their ideas and. Yeah, they just they just fit really really well with the the group. What's what's your favorite part of the new album? Oh, um, hmm, it's a tough one actually. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you two. There is one song that's called Gallows, and that has um, a friend of ours, Johnny Nocash, who's kind of like this punk uh, country guy, and we I just really like the raspiness of his voice, and I just like how he just he really um like has this kind of uh just this heaviness to his voice that would be perfect to suit with a with a metal band so i had uh him join uh on one song and i just like all of us when we we're listening back to it we we're just going okay this is this is this is the one this is the one that we show first because it's this really folky element but it's got more it's kind of like i want to say it's kind of thrash grass ish if that makes any sense, like, you know, um, oh crap, I don't know what that band, uh, that band is really skipping on me, but they combine like thrash metal with bluegrass. I forget what that band is called. Um, oh, uh, I think I know what you're talking, uh, uh, some zeal and ardor. No, 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 not, no, not, no, zeal, no. not, not zeal and ardor, but, um, uh, I, I'll probably, I'll probably find it the moment after the interview and be like, that was the band, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but it's kind of like, it's a, it's a mixture of like thrash metal, punk, bluegrass, and um and uh just other folk in instrumentation that kind of follows it and just having his voice on it was really was really really cool and having gabe and and sam do the dual vocals on it with uh johnny was really was really really cool and i guess another one would be there's one song on it called motivation and that is the i would say the most polarizing song on the record because we have a hip-hop element to it and it's 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 like if you take um dropkick murphy's you put you give it a hip-hop thing then you add a bit of tower of power with it <laughs> and uh but then somehow you throw in like this hans zimmer score that throws into it on the second half of it and you're like you're, you're looking at it just going what the hell is this track all about it just jumps so much and it's such a jarring thing but somehow we throw in this like um, uh, the lyr the lyrics of it is is like about somebody who's going who's going insane. So the juxtaposition between Gabe doing the clean vocals and Sam doing the harsh ones kind of this um, it, this really like they they trade vocals all the time. But in this song, it's really obvious where it's like a section that's Sam's, a section that's Gabe, and it's it's one of those songs that we. We, we listen to and we just laugh our head off and we're just thinking, should we put this on the record or shouldn't we? And all, all of us unanimously go, yeah, let's put, let's, let's put it on the record. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those songs like we probably won't play it live, but, um, but we thought we would, we would, we would put it on the record because we all just still enjoy listening to it. 
So, so uh, throughout all this lockdown, it sounds like you've been keeping pretty busy. I mean, writing new music and, and making recording it all. Uh, is, is it been just like a constant, like creative kind of go free for all for the last year? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, throughout the whole uh, lockdown, it was pretty much just like, well, I could, I have two options. I could, you know, since we're not playing, I could just not do anything or I could spend, spend the free time that I do have to just write as much as I possibly can. And, and that's what I did. I just pretty much just, uh, opened my, my laptop and just opened up guitar pro, uh, put a MIDI keyboard in front of me, uh, right beside my drum kit and just start write anything in it and in everything practically. And throughout the, the lockdown, I, I was, I was lucky enough to kind of come up with a bunch of different, uh, solo EPs that I've been that I've been really working on, and uh, and I'm excited to to share it once it's uh, once they're all fully done. So I've, it's kind of been, kind of gone the Devin Townsend route, where it's like you have one record that sounds like this type of style, and then one record that sounds like this, and then the other ones. Um, so yeah, so basically, what came of the me writing during the lockdown was that I have four EPs written, all in different uh, metal styles. And then one like singer songwriter is kind of thing, like a, like a, not like a porcupine tree, but kind of close in, in, in that sort of style, I guess, not, not so much prog, but more of like a simpler, uh, simpler version of it. <laughs> kind of getting uh, that kind of psych rock kind of vibe kind of thing. So, something like that. Yeah. Like more like Steve Wilson's like last solo, re- uh, solo record where it was n- not, not necessarily prog, but had some like kind of popish elements to it. Right. Yeah. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. And so you've been actually behind your drum kit quite a bit recently and uh, getting out there and doing shows and recording. How did it feel to finally go out and do your first show again, seeing people and like actually playing in front of human beings? What was that like? Oh, amazing. It was absolutely amazing just to kind of get back into, into playing live shows in front of an audience is, is something that's, uh, you know, you, you really, you really miss it. And because there's such a difference between playing into an empty room and then playing in front of an audience, like how the audience makes up such a big part of the live experience that, you know, once, once you hear the crowd after, after the first song, you just, and you're just so full of adrenaline and you're, you're just, you're just happy to be on stage playing with, playing with your friends and as well as just playing in front of an an audience. It just, it feels awesome. It was only weird in the sense that everybody was was sitting was sitting down and had and had um, masks on. Uh, obviously, because of the restrictions, everybody's being very uh, being very careful, which is which is you know good to see. And uh, uh, luckily, you know, there's been there has been kind of a um, a worry within within the music industry of whether or not people are ready to go and see live shows and whether or not they would feel safe enough to go to a concert. But it seems like a lot, a lot of people are very uh, respect, um, uh, respectful and keeping with the guidelines and, and no, and it's just, it's just, it just feels good to play live again. And yeah, and I just, just can't wait to play more, more live shows. Well, I can only imagine like being a, a well-known drummer from Toronto and just being a part of the scene, like it would be just such a huge change to your life to not have that in it anymore. So the fact that it's able to come back, it's it's really, really nice to see. And I, I love watching the stories of bands who've gone through and played shows and stuff. And you've made your way out here in the past to BC to play at our Armstrong Metal Fest, which is not too far from here in Penticton. That was with Vesperia, wasn't it? That's right. How was that? <laughs> it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. That was uh, that was our our tour that we did just before we went to Vakken, and that was um, kind of the 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 farthest we we went. Um, uh, I think on that tour was to to play Armstrong, and then after that we were were making our way back uh, back east, and it was great. It was um, it was just it, we had such a blast there, and uh, we hope to play play there again in the future uh one notable highlight 
uh, aside from, you know, seeing all of these great bands and, and, uh, and having, uh, and like being fortunate enough to share the same stage with Cattle Decapitation that same day was, was absolutely amazing. But one thing that really stands out is that, okay, long story short, our guitar player, Casey, he brings a unicycle on tour everywhere he goes because that's just his, his thing, right? Um, but on this particular day, he fell and he ripped the toenail uh, off, I think, his left foot. And so we had to take him to uh, the paramedics. They kind of they stitched him up, did, did their thing, but he lost his shoe. So if you look at the photos from the Armstrong Metal Fest back in 2015, and you see Casey, there's a big Pilsner box that is attached to his left foot, and it's covered in duct tape because we had to make this makeshift shoe for him to get kind of on and <laughs> off stage. And, and I, just, uh, I just felt so bad for the guy, but he soldiered on, and, uh, and I thought that was one of the, the best shows that we played on that tour. And... <laughs> And yeah, no, it was just, it was such a cool festival and uh, just hopefully, uh, hopefully we get to play there again. And, and his toe is okay. It recovered. Oh, we, <laughs> yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure it's fine now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the the takeaway from that is the lesson learned, always bring an extra pair of shoes to the festival. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> or an extra pair of shoes on tour. That's it. That's, I think, uh, is what's going to be one of the, the necessary necessary things and and after that after that tour the unicycle uh, is officially retired now <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh the progressive genre is one of these genres that uh i mean i when i got uh, into it when i was a teenager it was all about who can play the fastest and who can play the most complicated things and like who who is the best and there was such a huge focus on competition and mm-hmm. when I was young, I felt that. I felt like I, w- I don't play fast enough. I don't play good enough. It's not complex enough. I'm, I'm just nothing compared to these guys. But I've, it takes time to kind of get over that and realize that music isn't the Olympics. Uh, was that ever a thing for you, figuring that out? Oh, it's an ongoing thing. It's, it, I, I think that every time I see, you know, if I see a friend of mine play, if I go to a clinic of like a drummer that I really like, there's always moments where I go, fuck this like i am i i suck at my instrument (laughs) and and you know you get you get kind of those moments where you you feel like you're just not you're not good enough to to play but but you know those only last for such a short amount of time because uh because when you're playing in bands with with your friends or you're doing session work and and you're starting to like get into this, uh, get into the the music that that's being played. You just kind of you forget all of the, all of that stuff, and you just play because it's fun, and and you kind of revisit those um, those feelings that you had had previously, and you go, yeah, you know what, I do deserve to to play to play music for for a living because because I put so much passion and joy into uh into what i into what i do that it just feels like you know this is this is the right career path you know and but but of course there's going to be moments where where it pops up where think moments like that pop up where you you feel uh like you feel like you're not good enough you feel like you're that you're like one of the worst players ever like you kind of go down this kind of deep rabbit hole but but music is supposed to be fun first and foremost. And, and like you said, it's not the Olympics, right? So no, it's it just when you play music, it's supposed to be a really fun thing. And, and if, if somebody is, um, you know, trying to bolster themselves, it's like, oh, I could play the fastest or I can play this or that. And it's like, dude, just, just calm down. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, no man it's you just gotta yeah just have fun with it it's music this is a staple question that i always ask my guests and it's kind of corny but i still like to ask it go for it what advice would you give to anyone who's just trying to achieve their dreams no i just say just go for it like i i like listen it's like we 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 only live once i um 
I think, <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we don't, we don't know that until, until we're all in, we, we don't know that for sure until we're all in the grave, but, um, but no, man, it just, you just gotta have, you just gotta go for it, have fun. And there's going to be bumps along the way. And the biggest thing is that if you persevere long enough with anything that you want to do in life, uh, good things are going to happen. Like I'm a, I'm a, like, I believe that if you do, if you work hard, good things will happen. And if you really want something to happen, it will happen. Like, like I, like before, before we did the Valken, uh, Valken battle, like all of us really so badly wanted to play Valken because, you know, seeing the documentary and then just seeing all of our favorite bands play. And one goal that I've always I, I always had that I was lucky to accomplish back in 2015 is I wanted to share the same festival as Opeth, my favorite band. And, you know, you, you like, you just kind of, you just dream about wanting something so badly. And then when you work your ass off, things will happen. And, you know, I was lucky enough that that dream happened. And so, you know, for somebody pursuing it, I think it's a very, noble thing and i think you shouldn't uh you shouldn't hesitate on what you want to do with your life and i think that if you have a dream you should really go for it and and don't hold back i hope you're paying attention to everybody that that was uh wise words from someone who knows (laughs) (laughs) and i also always like to extend the offer if there's any song you'd like to request that i throw into the playlist for this week it it's fans of you know what kind of music you like keeps my show more diverse lets me discover new bands so anything at all it doesn't even have to be metal um like it could just be anything it doesn't have to be like new or uh at all it could be something that's anything anything okay anything Uh, at all yeah one of my favorite songs by 12 foot ninja is Uh, is a song called coming for you uh, oh yeah it's so good it's such a good song and it's just that's the kind of like going back to kind of the previous thing of like of why progressive metal is such an intriguing genre. It's because of songs like that. It's because of, you can throw in Latin music and you can throw in funk music. You can be, you can be completely wild with your songwriting and be completely far out that, uh, that, you know, the whole thing of music being fun, that's a fun thing. Like nobody's listening to that song with their arms crossed with corpse paint on thinking they're hot <laughs> shit and and thinking like that like oh we are so brutal and heavy and and see how many goat heads we can sever on stage because we're so badass when really they live in the like the the safest country on the planet and their crime rate is super low and it's just like it's like come on dude you're trying to you're trying to convince me that you're badass it's like fuck <laughs> off with that shit <laughs> it's like it's like i get it that's not scary man that's halloween but <laughs> yeah. but anyways you can t- you can tell which subgenres of metal that i like and ones that i just think are stupid <laughs> but listen listen but that's just that's just my thing if you like black metal then 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 go for it then it's it's you know i can see i can see why it's such an intriguing genre but it's not for me and that's why that's why i kind of um like bands that are the complete opposite of that because instead of people being so angry and upset that they're going to a show and feeling miserable you'd see a band like 12 foot ninja play everybody's happy everybody enjoys themselves everybody like is it loves the kind of craziness of it. And some, sometimes people can misinterpret that as being very cringy, but listen, at least they admit that they're cringe and they're not trying to pretend that they are like some sort of like sorcerer badass. Right. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Kind of went on a little bit of a rant there, but uh... <laughs> I, I think the yeah. takeaway there is that it, it, it's a band that takes the music seriously, but not themselves. Exactly. And that, and that's such a, that's such a, that's such a human thing, right? It's like you want the authenticity of of the music to be good, but you also want to see the musician not be so full of themselves, right? And and Twelve Foot Ninja is just a band that's just really goofy, takes the music seriously, but doesn't, but like you said, doesn't take themselves seriously, and that's what makes them such an enjoyable band to listen to. 
I find it interesting too that you picked the Twelve Foot Ninja song because you also did that uh, episode for Banger TV where you talked about Australian progressive bands and just, I mean, how Australia just seems to be kicking ass right now. <laughs> Australia, Australia always kicks ass with prog. They are one of the strongest countries to put out so many good progressive metal bands that it, it was impossible for me to pick uh, to pick five because. I knew the moment I picked the five, I know like people are going to be like, where's Voyager? Where's Alarum? Yeah. And, <laughs> and I go like, listen, like I love those bands too. If I was to have like a top 10, they would definitely be in it, but I could only pick five. And those were my personal five favorites, right? Like seeing Pliny on there is just, is like Pliny is just a ridiculous guitar player and he's so clever. And, and you see like, you know, Neil Blibiscaris is great. 12 Foot Ninja is great. Dead Letter Circus all of these bands, they're in the progressive sphere, but they're all so different from each other. Yeah. And that's yeah. what makes it, again, so intriguing is that when I, when I go and see, like, uh, when I go and see one of these bands play with other uh, prog bands, everybody sounds different. You know, it's like when I saw Neil Blibiscaris with Sarah Longfield and Winter Sun, that was one of the coolest shows I saw that year because you have three prog acts, but... One is primarily kind of in the folk um, genre because of uh, Yari's past with um, with Insafirum. Nubla Viscaris, which is like tech death with a violin, which is badass. And then Sarah Longfield is kind of like ambient guitar virtuoso and kind of and having that kind of YouTube um, sensation tag with it made for a really, really intriguing live lineup. And I, I just like seeing shows like that because it just offers so much more than just seeing like five decent death metal bands, right? That kind of sound pretty similar to each other. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to wrap this up now. So everyone, you've been listening to The Peach Pit. I've been here talking with Dylan Gowan, a well-known drummer from the greater Toronto area who's played with acts like Io Mare, Vesperia, and Birds of Bellwoods. He's also known for his appearances on Banger TV. And today we got to talk about so many great things. I'm really excited to hear the new Io Mare album. And uh, just in general, this has been such a great time. Thank you so much for time, taking time to talk to me. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for having me. Of course. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you too. <laughs>